Hey everyone, welcome to Content and Conversation. Today we're gonna to be digging into the Bear Metrics story. I have Corey Haynes here, head of growth at Bear Metrics, and we're gonna be talking about their success story, how they've grown from here with content marketing and other channels as well. I'm excited to be here with you, Corey. Thank you. Yeah, excited. So one of the things that is specifically interesting about Bear Metrics, for anyone who's not familiar, um, I guess how would you, I'll let you describe in like a sense how, what is Bear Metrics? Yeah, so it's basically, we started as a metrics and analytics platform for SaaS businesses. Okay. Um, and then since then we've sort of added on a couple of uh, other products, add-on tools. So um, now we're sort of metrics and retention, mainly for SaaS and subscription-based businesses. Cool. And, and part of that, and, and you guys do this, other people do that, you can actually at any time open up bare metrics revenue numbers, which I think is pretty impressive. Yep. Uh, scary <laughs> to see, like, this is the growth numbers and all that. Uh, but that is a core component of what makes you guys you. Guys you. Um, and specifically, one thing I wanted to kind of dig into um, is your founder, was it Josh Pickford is yep, his name? Josh. I wrote a recent post where he actually, you all got an offer to sell the company for I think $5 million and he walked through the frustrations of that process. It didn't go through, uh, it was expensive, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the outcomes from that, I was listening to another podcast um, for Tiny Seed, which is on similar concept that, hey, there's some nervousness to saying explicitly, hey, I, we wanted to sell and I was ready to go to the, the end line and sell for maybe various reasons. One, customer perception, employee perception. Uh, what does that do for morale? So as someone on the inside, you see this post, what is your action there? Like, is there a morale hit? How, is your, how did you react to seeing that content? Or I'm sure you heard about it before that, but. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, so Josh, <laughs> uh, thankfully, he messaged us on Slack, you know, a few weeks before he published a uh, post and he gave us the whole story and talked about what happened, what he was going through. And obviously the reason matters, you know, and so if he was selling because he was greedy and wanted to get rich and <laughs> it was just sick and tired of us or he didn't like us anymore, then we'd have been like, okay, that hurts a little bit and now we have to work for you still. But <laughs> given the context, um, you know, we completely understood what he was going through and uh, none of us felt betrayed in any way. I mean, I would have done the exact same thing probably, to be honest. Okay. Um, can you remind me what what was the quick context of the why? Yeah, I mean, really, it was just kind of like a perfect storm of like personal stuff going on and stress. And also, I mean, he's been going at it for six years. We have a small team bootstrap, so it's a grind and it gets tiring. And uh, he got like a random offer. Um, and then he was like, yeah, maybe that could be in range. And then a bunch of other offers came and essentially got the conversation going, which is kind of like in the process. Okay. Um, so it made sense at the time and just kind of fell on his lap. And how did it, so if that's the case, did it, is that an ongoing feeling for you all that this is gonna happen again? What's my trajectory at the company? Is there any concerns there? Or? Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the question is still there, but he told us uh, really afterwards that while it was super defeating in the moment to just kind of get ghosted by the potential acquirer and um, felt a little bit down, like, okay, well now what do I do? And you know, you, psych you kind of work yourself up psych psychologically a little bit too. And like, okay, well now my company's gonna be sold and you're already thinking about what's my next steps and where am I gonna go after this? Um, but he shared with us later that he kind of had a second wind and felt re really re-inspired to work on the business. And I think that kind of passed along to us too. And so, I mean, even after he shared the, the initial message, um, we just got back to work and it really yeah. didn't change anything okay. about the way that we thought and the way that we did our job. Um, now, you know, we're, we're kind of re-inspired and re-motivated to take the business to the next level and keep growing and keep pushing. Uh, we have a lot of new processes, hiring for the first time. Uh, we're hiring more than we ever have before. Okay. Cool. Um, so to be honest, it's been fun. I mean, obviously there's still that looming question, but just like there would be with any other business. Yeah, and that's true. And I guess in pretty much any scenario, it's not like you guys would just go away after that acquisition. You'd just yeah. keep working on the business, obviously in a new context, but yeah. um, that, probably wouldn't be inherently demotivating, hopefully. Mm -hmm. No, definitely not. <laughs> and he shared with us too, it's funny because a few months before that, uh, you know, there was kind of a random question from one of the other employees about, hey, like, would you ever consider? And he told us like, yeah, not knowing the story that had happened already. And he told us that really the big thing for him was making sure that we all had 
um, a good fit and we'd have a good transition and that it would be the right, you know, essentially transition. You know, that we wouldn't have to go move to another city because we're a remote company. Yeah. Um, that the same, you know, no one would get cut automatically. Uh, and so that was like the big thing for him. And so he kind of reassured us that, hey, if, if there was an, uh, when we'd an have exit, to dry. Uh, yeah, he wouldn't leave us dry and there would be some sort of reward for us as well. So Nice. On, on the, I mean, that post is just one example and I haven't looked at the link numbers or anything like that, but I'm sure it's a pretty good uh, tractor and attraction of attention and obviously audience too. There's probably other SaaS companies who are running their own business and it's, it's just smart marketing yeah. generally. So um, that's been a big component of what you all do, not just with that, um, and maybe you could sp speak to the other open um, things you use, but how I think it should be inspiring for other companies to, to leverage that transparency from a marketing standpoint. Mm -hmm. And also just be um, uh, transparent with your own team, and there's obviously benefits there too. But I, I don't know if you could speak to how you think other people could potentially leverage transparency um, and have more ways that you do it at Bear Metrics. Yeah, so to give you a little bit of context of like how it works for us, I mean, if you looked back through our Google Analytics, you would see that like the most transparent posts are the ones that blow up the biggest because it's stories you don't hear elsewhere and it's new data, new insights. Uh, I mean, the I'm a, I almost sold Bear Metrics for, for five million is definitely one of the more popular ones. Uh, other ones as well, like even um, how we sold uh, sort of another add-on product called Intros last year, uh, we actually, basically shut it down after a couple months and then ended up selling it, and that was another okay. big one. Um, but other things too, like how freemium almost caused us to explode, um, you know, raising a small round. Uh, they're all, I mean, for us, again, I think context matters a lot because for us, our target customer is other SaaS businesses, and namely founders and kind of executives or operators of those SaaS businesses. So Josh sharing his experiences, being open, being transparent, is the exact type of content that would attract that type of customer. Um, so That's I think, a it, great point, I think yeah. it makes sense to like be transparent and open in the way that it makes sense for you and for your business. So uh, for us, it's sharing our revenue numbers. You can go to you know, demo.bearmetrics.com. You can go to the other open startups uh, and you can see your revenue and that really shows our product. For others, it might be traffic. For others, it might be just sharing the experiences and tactics of what works. Um, even just you know talking to customers themselves and kind of allowing them to be transparent and open and kind of revealing what's working for their customers and um, and for other businesses like theirs. So really, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it comes down to what does it make sense for you to be transparent about. Uh, but I think there there is a really good opportunity for every business. I mean, it's it's, be slightly... it's a it can be a competitive advantage in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. You know, because the more open you are, the more that you share, the more trust it builds, the more attention you get. Uh, and you can kind of carve out that expertise for yourself a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I think you hit on a really important point there that you're, tar you're speaking to your target audience with those posts. Yeah. I do think of like, if it was a random HR software blog, like would that person speaking to those same things have the same effects because their audience is HR? But maybe... I, and maybe this is not, they'd have to figure out this legal situation, but maybe in their context, their head of HR, I, I, let me know if you agree with this, their head of HR could maybe speak to actual situations they've gone through, and that's their method of transparency, because that's their customer. Yeah. Um, would you agree with that thought process? Yeah, I think so. I mean, even you look at other open startups like Buffer and ConvertKit, Hubstaff, all very different types of businesses than bare metrics, but they're still very open. They they share their uh, their revenue, you know, their their metrics. But even like Buffer, for example, um, they shared, you know, like their uh, the way that they hire and they are open about their salaries. Um, and for them, it has nothing to do with social media, but it's just kind of a marketing play. And that they're talking to other businesses. They build a lot of links. I mean, they get a lot of traffic, uh, and it's worked for them to some degree or not. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think it. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, again, have to be directly related to you and your business, but whatever you can be transparent about and just thinking about what your customers would want to hear from you um, is a good opportunity. So it's, it's, I mean, your tool, the transparency of being able to see the revenue numbers is great. I think of Moz in, in our industry, it was so great about transparency and how they were doing. But one of the things, it can be this real accelerant, I think, when things are going well, but how do you address the, when, and I think this sort of happened to Moz where almost when they started going the other direction, it 
had negative effects for them. So I don't know what you, how would you think about the worst case scenarios there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I actually don't think it's a, it's a bad thing um, because we have a couple of other open startups who have gone through, you know, declines in revenue or gone through struggles who have had to pivot or even, you know, let go of bigger customers. Um, and so you see the revenue drop, right? Or you see things kind of going down uh, into the right instead of up into the right. And you would think they would have maybe an adverse effect, but uh, we've actually, at least from what we've heard from them, has had the kind of opposite experience of customers are doubling down. They're asking, hey, how can we help? And here's a lot of feedback for you. Um, here's why I think customers are leaving, or here's what I think you should do. Um, but also, just from other founders, I mean, uh, there's already kind of a bias to only hear kind of the survivors or the, the success stories. Um, and I think people are really craving for like the struggles. And as weird as that sounds, like people want to know that they're not alone in their kind of their dips or the things they go through or uh, if their business isn't, as, isn't doing as well as they want to. And that way, again, you can build empathy, you can build trust. Yeah. Uh, it can be, here's what we learned, you know, here, here's how we can turn it around. Um, I mean, every great story comes from kind of like these uh, moments of, you know, being desperate and thinking like there's no way out of this. And then you work you yourself out. out and it can be you know, a great story in the end. Again, it's not just about the story, but it can work out that way. <laughs> yeah, it makes me think, I don't know how you would do this, but the, the companies that don't survive, they're still post-mortem. And you see those, I see those occasionally yeah. on like Hacker News and stuff, like why my startup didn't work. And those always, as you touched on, do the best because you always hear about the success, which is not always reality, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so something I, I I realized in my uh, in in being naive, really, I heard your title, head of growth, um, and probably just in my experience, I thought, yeah, it's just another way of saying head of marketing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't have a SaaS background. We do help sell SaaS companies, uh, but could you speak to like what is the difference between a head of growth for the people who don't know and a head of marketing, and like why is that? difference important yeah totally and i don't blame you at all because <laughs> my mom thinks i'm the head of marketing like that's what i tell people i don't want to be compared to your mom it's e no no no, no. <laughs> it's easier to understand yeah, yeah um but yeah so traditionally for a head of marketing you really kind of take like the beginning of the customer journey and you know you're responsible for turning visitors into leads uh traditionally you know for a SaaS business for example um, and so for a head of growth in my role i'm really taking a really full funnel kind of full customer journey approach um, from you know visitor all the way through customer to advocate, um, acquisition, activation, uh, retention, revenue, referral. And so it's about anything that produces revenue at the end of the day, to be honest. So it's not just about you know marketing things that are about you know let's drive traffic to the blog and let's run ads, but it's about pricing and it's about um, affiliate marketing. It's about even retention and how do we save more customers? What are the things that are going to move the needle? and allowing us to keep more customers around. Mm -hmm. um, so growth, you can think of just like revenue growth uh, in the sense that I just have kind of a more full spectrum uh, of kind of oversight over the customer journey. So do you think that makes sense for pretty much any early stage SaaS business that it should be their first like marketing, like would you even describe yourself as a marketing hire? I guess. Yeah, I, yeah, I think okay, so. Yeah. I mean, I think the majority of my job comes down to marketing and the sales. Okay. Um, and with our kind of business model being uh, a free trial and having like a very self-serve experience, most things I do are kind of more marketing related. Okay. Because I just have to get people in and I just have to help them get activated and get up and running with the product. Okay. But it's not like I'm having to onboard and negotiate and, uh, and to close deals that often. Um, okay. And so I think especially for small SaaS businesses, early stage, it makes a lot of sense because um, you're, not, you're not so departmentalized in a lot of other traditional businesses. With SaaS, you're working across teams, um, but also again, there's a lot of success that happens after you acquire a customer. It matters how long you keep the customer around. It matters if you can upsell them. It matters if they upgrade. Um, and so those are all things that should be incorporated or at least considered by a head of marketing or someone in charge of that kind of role. Do you put ratios on that? Like 30% of my time should be, you mentioned freemium, so maybe that factors into it. Like should be new users, 30% should be retention. Like how do you think about that model or prioritization yeah. framework? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, first it comes down to like, what's the kind of burning fire in front of you and, <laughs> yeah. and what needs the most attention. Like if retention is going down, exactly. attack it. Yeah, I mean, I like to break things down to like the classic pirate, pirate metrics of uh, acquisition, activation, retention, referral, revenue. Okay. Um, and so, uh, I mean, really, 
for my job, if I just broke things down into like marketing, sales, retention, it'd probably be like 40% uh, marketing, 30, 35% sales, and then 30, 35% retention. Okay. Um, but retention also including like referrals and revenue, so upgrades and upselling, cross-selling, things like that. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, we're not a SaaS business. We do have reoccurring revenue with our clients. Right. But there is an instinct for me, I think, just to keep doing marketing, um, when in reality, a lot of our growth, like a huge percentage of our growth comes from current clients growing, um, obviously retaining them. And there's always this thing, I get anxiety if we don't get enough leads coming in the door and I got to go attack that. But um, I, I don't know how I... I'm, I'm sure this is not just unique to me of like no. new leads. Do you guys experience that? Or you experience that at yeah, all? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I feel like we already have a really strong kind of organic acquisition funnel. And so we get leads and trials every month. Um, I'm not too worried about like that just kind of drying up. Yeah. But at the same time, um, the top of the funnel matters. And so, you know, you can't like focus too long on one area and then let the other area go dry. Um, it does have to be a constant. You know, that's why, I mean, if I just spent one month only doing marketing, then we'd probably see it on the other end with uh, with churn or with um, customers not upgrading be a little bit slower of a you know expansion revenue month mm -hmm. um, and then vice versa. Gotcha. So in, in thinking about your role, um, I think I think you've I, I read on your growth manifesto, I'm pretty sure or correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you had this great post about the ways you think about growing bare metrics or any potential company could. And in regards to that role, I think you had a prioritization kind of framework. Is that right? Could you speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah kind of the bottom up approach. Yeah. 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 So um, when I started Bear Metrics, I was really trying to think about like uh, being kind of a one man growth team, mm -hmm. being a small company, uh, what's going to move the needle for us and how can I make the best use of my time? Because I don't have a big team of designers and developers and other marketers to pull from. Um, so how should I really think about this and prioritize? Um, and so really what it came down to was it doesn't make sense to start at the top of the funnel with, activi or with acquisition um, because it kind of results or it could result in kind of a leaky bucket, if you will. Okay. Um, and I didn't want to just go and do the usual marketing things of like redesign the website and start writing a bunch of ads and do, I don't know, a rebrand or something <laughs> and then have all those visitors not turn into leads or leads not into customers or customers who just churn out because they're not a good fit. Right? Okay. Um, and so... I really started taking an approach of bottom up in that I wanted to start with revenue and referrals of like, how do we um, upsell, cross sell? How do we get more revenue from our existing customers and adding more value to them? Because that could be a really easy win. And actually for us, that was exactly the case because we have a couple of uh, add-on products. And so it was actually like low hanging fruit and that a lot of our customer base didn't even know that these things existed and we hadn't done a good job before. Okay. And so run a couple of campaigns, do a couple of uh, incorporate a couple of you know things in the product, find more ways to get it in front of customers, and hey, that's new revenue, right? I didn't even have to go and acquire new customers or write a blog post okay. or run an ad. Um, but also, I mean, the whole SaaS business in and of itself is completely dependent on retention um, because once you acquire a customer and you, ju you just got like one twelfth or one one hundredth of the lifetime value that you're hoping to get out of them uh, through their lifetime with you. And so just you know, uh, just acquiring a customer isn't, it's just the beginning really of your journey with them. Um, and so having a good foundation of retention really ensures that all the acquisition you're going to do later is, isn't done in vain. Right. You know? So one, one word you said there that I was curious to dig into was uh, your referral process. Mm -hmm. Did you attack that at all? You mentioned. Yeah, we're actually just getting to that okay. now. Um, but in the beginning too, I mean, one of the really easy kind of quick wins is okay. to find your power users. Uh, find the people who love you, who advocate for you, who give you testimonials, and just say, hey, would you mind sharing? Or is there anyone you think could uh, could use Metrics? Or who are your other you know, founder friends or you know, whatever it is for your business? Okay. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, that I, would, I think for us at the time, it didn't make sense to attack right away. But for other businesses, that can be a really easy win. So are you, so you're just going to reach out proactively and say, do you know anyone that knows this? Is that kind of? Yeah, I think that's like a good, like one kind of one-time thing to kind of kickstart things. Uh, but now we're rolling out with a referral program for existing customers, also an affiliate uh, program for partners who want to okay. promote bear metrics and become a partner and kind of our whole, you know, join our marketing team, if you will. Um, but yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense for other businesses as well. And I, I remember one piece of your growth manifesto was do things that don't scale. Yeah. Uh, is there, uh, uh, you don't have to go through every point, but like what are your favorite parts of those kind of like philosophies that you have? Yeah, yeah, I think 
Um, we have a kind of tendency to maybe optimize too quickly and like scale things or automate things too quickly, even okay. before we even know that things work. Um, and so I really wanted to get in the weeds of like, what are the things that work even if they don't scale? Um, and one of the things I realized through the process too is that like most things actually don't scale at all. Like you, <laughs> okay. you still have to hire more people or you still have to, you know, you reach a certain point and then you have to optimize, you have to figure something out. And so we try to over optimize too quickly. Okay. So some of the things that I've done that don't scale and still don't scale, and to be honest, sometimes are kind of a pain in the ass, is that <laughs> uh, I've, I make like these personalized videos for trialing customers. And so I'll send an email, say, hey, can I run through your account uh, and make a really quick video, you know, 10 minutes, um, and just show you a couple of things I think might be interesting for you. Okay. And I make, you know, maybe five of those a week, and those customers are two to three times more likely to convert. Um, I'll even run through like a landing page or a pricing or an onboarding review with them and just say, hey, like there's no, uh, no strings attached. I just want to <laughs> help you with your business, add some value. And that allows me to build a relationship and build some rapport okay. and hopefully build some trust with them. And that might result into, you know, a business relationship as a customer. Do you think there's any reason for, I'm, pro I'm sure it depends on the price point of a customer. What do you guys charge at the bottom end per month? Yeah, it starts own? at 50. Our average revenue per user is about 150. Okay. And, uh, can you share like your customer lifetime value? Yeah, it's it's it hovers between like four to six thousand dollars. Okay, I was just trying to think: is there a threshold where, like, do you believe every SaaS business should be doing that? Is there a threshold where it just doesn't make sense? Um, as you can scale it, as you can scale it, I think it does. I mean, if you can find those ways to just, um, for example, like another company, another customer of ours actually is Bonjoro, and okay. they allow you to send like these personalized videos to new users, customers. Um, unfortunately, we can't use them because I have to like screen share and record through <laughs> someone's account. But uh, that's a really unscalable thing that they've managed to make um, more scalable. Uh, it's not completely automated, but I mean, if you have a five dollar a month business or you know product that you're that you're selling, maybe it doesn't make sense to do that forever. In the early days, I mean, go for it. Like you have to kind of scrape and claw for every mm -hmm. customer. Um, and the higher, like the more revenue that you're getting from each customer, the more it makes sense to do those things because you don't have to worry about as many and you can focus more attention on those. Yeah, and on your point there, I mean, some of that could be relatively simple math, actually. You mentioned increasing the retention rate by X amount. Uh, you know, they're gonna be around for six more months. Mm -hmm. You're getting that much, much more revenue. If you're spending one hour on it, what is the cost of that hour or equivalent person on your team? Exactly. It's probably pretty straightforward. It's actually more straightforward math than it probably seems whether or not you should do that or not. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the uh, one of the other things we're kind of testing out right now too is doing like customer check-ins. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a customer success team of two and we have about, you know, over 800 customers. So you look at that ratio and you're like, no, this isn't going to work. But just having a quarterly or even biannual check-in with customers, you know, you don't do them all at once because you don't want to just, you know, fill up your calendar for the next three months. <laughs> but you just say, hey, you know, for anyone uh, interested, you know, can we check up with you? Can we see how things are going? Can we help you with anything? Can we teach you or train you how to use the product? And those things uh, have helped save customers. They've helped um, upsell customers. Um, so you look at kind of the hours spent there and it's a great investment. Yeah, one thing we do that's similar to that, that just comparable is we do a six month check-in with our clients, like client questionnaire, how, are, how do you think this compares to the sales process? What's our kind of NPS score, things like that. And that's also a good point to say, similar to your referral model, like would you be willing to refer us to someone else? Even if we don't aggressively ask, but we just ask that question. Right. Um, would you be willing to do a case study? That can be valuable, I'm sure, for you guys too. Mm -hmm. um, I totally agree with that thought process, it's valuable. Yeah. So another model, um, big model guy, <laughs> <laughs> that I, I've heard you mention is the grows model. Could you speak to that? And yeah. A short version maybe? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, again, as like a one man team, but I think for anyone as well, uh, you have to have a process for, especially growth experiments. You know, I mean, a lot of like um, traditional marketing things like writing blog posts, ads, like they're very kind of like continuous um, things that you just keep doing one after the other. And you don't need like a really, you want a hard process and being able to repeat it and get better at it over time. But when you're testing on new ideas, like new experiments, um, you really want to be buttoned up because, okay. uh, and the, I've gone through this too, and I've learned the hard way of like, you, you know, put something into the queue, you know, like with a designer or a developer, um, or even just start working on your, something yourself, and then it sits there for two months or three months. Or, uh, so anyways, you wanna have a good process around it. So, kind of came up with this because it's super easy to understand and it's uh, conveniently named grows. Acronym, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it just stands for uh, gather, rank, outline, work, and study. And so okay. 
Um, really, it's my process and with the team as well, is we'll just uh, brainstorm freely. We don't have a whiteboard because we work remotely, but we'll just uh, <laughs> get everything in Notion, you know, some other other project management app, um, and just get every idea down. Like no bad idea exists. Uh, just get it all down on paper or, or virtually, and then rank because you won't be able to do everything, and you want to be able to understand again what are the low hanging fruit, what are the things going to be uh, the most impactful for us. Okay. Um, and I like the ICE score, you know, impact, confidence, ease, kind of classic growth hackers model. Um, and then outline. I think this is actually probably one of the more overlooked um, parts of the process, and that most of the time you just kind of like write up maybe a quick paragraph or even just give it a name. And then maybe you expect, like you might know what it is, but other people might not know what that is. Um, so we started just asking two questions, and it's just why and what. So why should we do this? And so you write a couple bullet points on like, we think that it will increase conversions by X amount, or because this will help us compete in X or Y, Z. Um, and then with what, you just kind of, what are all the things involved? So does this mean we need a landing page? Does this mean we need to run an ad? Do okay. we need to tweak things? And you just define it, get it on paper. And then work, right? So get in the project management system, get at it, uh, give it enough time to test, and then study what worked, what didn't work, okay. um, and then what can we take and learn, uh, in, or what did we learn that we can take into the next experiment? Yeah, it sounds like a great model. One of the things, random thought I had off of that was curious how, do you guys do a meeting and then just have this Notion spreadsheet in out open and that you can all, it allows live editing, right? Yeah, or, it does. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I use Notion for a to-do list for myself, but not in that capacity. Yeah, we actually, I mean, uh, we've moved away from basically every kind of like live interaction. Um, we're spread over like six time zones, so it's kind of unique to us. But we, we don't have any meetings really at all. Wow. Uh, we do a lot of like asynchronous communication over Slack mainly. Um, and so it's basically just me posting a message like, hey, here's what we're doing. When you have 10 minutes today, can you please go through into your ideas? Or I'll just basically like write free form like my thoughts of here's what I'm thinking or here's how I'm going about this. What do you think about this idea? And then we can always thread from there and kind of go back and forth. Okay. Um, but really we just kind of do things uh, ad hoc a little bit and like, Hey, here's what we're doing. Can you chip in? We have a second. It might take a couple days, but okay. it works really well for us at least. Do you guys have like to-do lists and stuff like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, personally, yeah. but we don't have like a really hard and fast project management system uh -huh. uh, outside of like Notion's kind of where we keep everything. And that's where I'll like keep all my ideas and experiments. And that's where I'll just kind of like allow people to go in and, you know, make comments, make suggestions. And then once it's like solid and we have the outline and we're ready to, to work, then we'll put it in something like Clubhouse. And that's where we all know, like, these are the things that we're working on. That way we can see what each other is working on. Okay. Time. We use Basecamp and um, 10,000 feet, which is enterprise project management time tracking tool at this point. It's not perfect, but always kind of interested to hear how people work, especially remotely. Yeah. Um, does that get, it sound like, honestly, my instinct was like, that's, especially from a remote capacity, that sounds a little lonely to me. Never meeting. Is that anything to that? Or I'm how a little bit introverted, to be honest. Okay. I think most so people on the team are. You're a coffee um, shop guy, right? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, yeah. I mean, I work from home, coffee shop. Yeah. Uh, don't do the co-working spaces. But um, there's definitely some people who are a little bit more extroverted. We all, like, need to build rapport and have a relationship. Like, we're all friends anyways. Right. Um, and so what we do is we have a little thing called Donuts, and it'll pair with one person a week, and we'll just get, like, a virtual coffee and meet um, okay. and talk for, you know, 30 minutes or an hour and just kind hmm. of um, go through things, personal, work, doesn't matter. But that allows us to kind of get that time together that we need. Okay. Yeah, I, I think about that. There's, all, I mean, there's always we have a lot of remote people. We are cross collaborate a lot. My instinct is that could add to a feeling of too many meetings. But you guys do a good job. It seems like of no other meetings, so that doesn't impact on your ability to be productive. It sounds like. Yeah, yeah. And when you say donut, is that literally is that another acronym <laughs> or is that a tool? No, or? that's what it's called. It's called donuts. It is donuts? a tool. I think so. Yeah, it's like a Slack bot, and so. Oh, cool. Um, so it forces. Oh, okay. We yeah, like you. That. Uh, you enter the channel or you like uh -huh. you add it to the channel and then everyone in the channal like it pulls from in a pool kind of like okay you know you two are paired and you two are paired and then it cycles through oh cool nice all right we will do that probably <laughs> yeah that's fun <laughs> yeah so uh, one thing you mentioned uh, in our conversation um, offline that you've been interested and excited about is just the idea of these five main growth levers that companies need to use um, or are the main reasons companies grow? Could you speak to that? Yeah. Um, again, it's, it's pretty much from my experience, you know, being uh, the head of growth, I, I talk to like 10 to 20 founders a week. And um, so actually, I have a lot of meetings. <laughs> so uh, that allows me to be productive in that way. <laughs> That's how you yeah. try to batch them in the afternoons. But um, 
in you know being that we see revenue, we see metrics. I consult with a lot of these companies as well. I've built relationships with a lot of customers and founders. Um, it's really I'm kind of a frameworks guy, so I'm like, what what is it you know that's moving the needles, uh, moving the needle for all these companies, and like what are the commonalities? Um, and I, I guess I've sort of like boiled it down to like these are like the the things I see the most often that like make the biggest difference. Um, but the the five are market products, uh, your model, messaging and positioning, and then channels. Um, and the big thing there too, I think, is that all five of those have to be working inter interdependently. Like they're all, if you just have four, you don't have one, like you have a broken system and you don't grow as much or even at all. Um, but those are kind of the big five that I've seen really like the companies who grow the most, who are successful, they all have these kind of five factors. So in putting that into practice, should someone, would you suggest people like look at those five things and like try to define them and see how strong they are? And if it feels like one is not clear, that might be a reason you're kind of stagnating or what, yeah. how do you put that in action? Exactly. I mean, yeah. that's really what it's born from. I was uh -huh. like, you know, people are always asking me like, hey, what's working for other companies? And um, how are these types of companies doing? And what's one thing that we're doing that, you know, others aren't? And so I've kind of like broken it down to this checklist of like, all right, well, let's look at your market and like, how are people spending money in your industry and how much money are they spending? How many people are there? And then on a micro level too, like, are you talking to your customers and what do you know about them? And um, and how close are you in the trenches to really knowing like what are they looking for? I mean, on the product side of things too, like you can't have a bad product. Like there's no yeah. <laughs> there's no way around having a really bad product. There's you know the amount of marketing management. Some magic people you can pull. Are, are some shitty products. <laughs> yeah, some people can pull it off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but even then, kind of... they they may have started with a really great product at the time. Um, so true. looking at like innovation, like are you solving a really big problem, a small problem? How frequent does this problem uh, appear? You know, what kind of competitive advantages do you have with your product? Because if there's nothing different about you, about you, then maybe that's the reason why customers aren't choosing you over a competitor. Um, model as well, like one of the things that's probably been the most surprising for me is how, how big of a deal your activation and your pricing model uh, have to do with your growth. I mean, you look at companies like, um, you know, Dropbox is a big example with their referral program and just being freemium, MailChimp, uh, even Notion. Um, my friend Scott Towsley, he made like this tweet about how uh, he had been using Evernote for free for like five years, started using Notion and after five months he managed to start paying um, just because of their basically activation model and that after a thousand blocks uh, You have like, to start paying. Yeah, yeah, you have to start paying. Um, so Evernote's lost opportunity, the reason why they couldn't convert them to a paying customer was just because of their activation model. And so think about all the customers maybe they could have gotten if they had a better activation mm -hmm. model. Um, same thing with messaging and positioning. It's a big thing as well with like most of the time channels fail not because uh, it's not working or because it's too expensive, it's because your messaging and positioning sucks and just because it's not compelling or it's jargony or just because it's not interesting. Right. Um, and then at the, at the end it's channels. You know, it's like, okay, well have you tried this? Have you tried that? And you go through the list of, okay, well let's take a look at this for you. Um, but all the other four kind of lead up to the channels. If you don't have all those four set up before you go and try to you know, put all of your VC cash into the yeah, channels. And marketing. <laughs> then it, you're going to have a hard time. Right. That makes sense. So, yeah, it sounds like a great auditing framework for, SaaS. I guess it could be any companies, really. Yeah, really, any company. Agree, I, but... like, specifically use it for SaaS. And yeah. kind of the most examples I have from my experiences in SaaS. Right. But really, yeah, you could, you could take it for any business. Nice. Yeah, so uh, this has been great, Corey. Um, to kind of leave people, I always like to give people a good actionable tip, resource, or anything you're kind of excited about that you would recommend for people, like what, what would that be? Yeah, uh, I'll go back to the activation model uh -huh. in that um, I think a lot of marketers, a lot of salespeople, um, growth hackers especially, they try to optimize for like lead volume and lead conversion rate. And really you should be optimizing for like literal new customers and what's gonna get you the most customers long-term. Um, and so your activation model, like. We have a lot of customers who switch from freemium to free trial or free trial to you know uh, money back guarantee or maybe try to go up market and then they switch to like a consultation model if you have to get a demo or talk to sales first and that ends up killing how many customers they get every month um, uh, and they end up kind of shooting themselves in the foot so my advice is always to choose the activation model that gets you the most customers long term don't optimize for leads or lead volume optimize for customers um, especially you can see like Within the first three months, like, are those customers turning out? Are they staying? If you have a really high retention rate, you know you're doing something right. Okay, so that's kind of the iterative model is look at it at three months and then 
evaluate from there. Yeah, pretty much like within the first 90 days, you usually know, uh, like, are you onboarding and activating customers correctly? Okay. Uh, or are you just getting them through and kind of like pushing them and then they're <laughs> like, all right, cool, now what do I do? Um, but if you have the right activation model, it should be apparent, you know, that you have really solid retention within the first three months. Nice. Well, it's been great, Corey. Uh, yeah, we talked about a lot of stuff here. You got a lot of great posts on most of these things. So we'll definitely link to those in the show notes. So check those out if you if you want more depth. Um, definitely follow Corey and Bear Metrics uh, to learn everything about them all the time because they're so open. <laughs> and if you like this, definitely appreciate it if you give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and let us know what you thought in the comments. Thanks for watching. Cool.